President Biden arrived in the UK today to talk to Rishi Sunak uh, on Ukraine and have a big NATO meeting in Lithuania tomorrow. He was also treated to a royal welcome by King Charles and the two held climate change talks at Windsor Castle. The president's faced criticism since the US announced they would provide cluster bombs to Ukraine with the UK, Canada, New Zealand and Spain <clears throat> all opposing the use of such weapons. Last year, former White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said that using cluster bombs is a war crime. There are reports of illegal cluster bombs and vacuum bombs being used by the Russians. Is there a red line for how much violence uh, will be tolerated against civilians in this manner that's illegal and potentially a war crime? It is. It would be. I don't have any confirmation of that. We have seen the reports. Uh, if, if that were true, it would potentially be a war crime. Well, joining me now is a former Conservative MP, Louise Mensch, former Navy SEAL, Rob O'Neill, and Talk TV's political editor, Kate McCann. And, Kate, I'll start with you. I just want to, uh, just before we come off that story we led on, uh, The Sun has now posted a new story saying the parents of the youngster at the centre of this BBC presenter scandal have said tonight that they've spoken out to protect their child. They stood by their allegation that the BBC star paid their child thousands in return for sex photographs. Uh, the mother and stepfather of the youngster also questioned who had paid to provide the child with an expensive lawyer. Um, so the lengthy story the son had just posted, which maybe will offer more clarity on this tomorrow. From a political point of view, Kate, the BBC, obviously, the government always gets involved and there's lots of politicians giving their views. What is the current feeling, do you think, from the government about what's going on there with this presenter? Well, I think the feeling overall across politics is that this is a concerning story. I mean, the Prime Minister's official spokesman was asked this morning what Rishi Sunak thinks of it, and he said that the allegations are worrying. And across the political spectrum, there has been a consensus that the BBC needs to ensure that its processes are fit for purpose, that it has done everything it can to follow up the complaint uh, by this youngster's parents. The claim is that that was not followed up accurately uh, in a timely manner, that the parents were deeply concerned that nothing was really happening. I think tonight the fact that the BBC is reporting on this statement from the youngster claiming that the allegations have nothing to them has caused some people to question what really is going on here. But as I'm sure you have said, and I'm sure many people have said across the board, the Sun newspaper is very careful. It has been very diligent in ensuring that the allegations have the weight that would be required to publish them. And I think this further article tonight further reinforces that. There will though still be those questions levelled at the BBC about whether they have taken appropriate action, and those still remain. Right. Well, we'll see. Uh, certainly a fast-moving story. And, Kate, the other big news, of course, in the UK... Uh, you've got this NATO summit coming uh, from tomorrow. You've had President Biden in the UK meeting Rishi Sunak, meeting King Charles. One of the main bones of contention here is about the United States' decision uh, through President Biden to send cluster bombs for Ukraine to use against the Russians, who themselves have used cluster bombs throughout this war. Uh, this is something that the, the, the uh, UK government implacably is opposed to. How much friction is that going to cause with these meetings, do you think? Well, the reality is that it did come up in the meeting between the Prime Minister and the President today, but not much friction is the answer to your question. Because realistically, although the UK is, as you say, signed up to a convention not to produce and to discourage the use of cluster bombs, when the two men met in Downing Street, although the Prime Minister's official spokesman did say that the issue was raised, I think it was very clear that the Prime Minister did not really push the President not to use those cluster weapons. In fact, there was a further statement made about how difficult the position that the US finds itself in regarding the production and uh, providing Ukraine with these weapons uh, really is. I mean, President Biden himself has said that he had to be convinced to send them, that he essentially didn't really want to have to, but that Ukraine is running out of ammunition and that the US is in a position to do so, one that the UK, of course, isn't, and many other countries who have signed up to that convention. 
So I don't think politically there's going to be a huge amount of pushback on the Americans, but there will be talk at the NATO summit about a long-term commitment to Ukraine. And that will encompass not just ammunition, although that will be at the forefront of lots of those conversations, but more politically too, about membership of NATO, about what happens next, about reinforcing and rebuilding the country, because there are still those questions about commitments. And I think this issue about ammunition, about who is prepared to send what, and perhaps a hardening of some countries when it comes to what is provided is worrying for the Ukrainians. And that's something that, you know, lots of nations will want to see a renewed commitment, I think, at NATO, that, that all of these countries will stand behind Ukraine, whatever happens and however long this goes on for. And yes, in some cases, however unpalatable that may be. Right. Rob O'Neill, I uh, can't think of anyone better to ask about this. You know all about battlefield munitions. Is it morally right for America, who have never said they wouldn't use them, but is it morally right for them to use cluster bombs for the Ukrainians to use against Russians? I don't think it's appropriate right now to use cluster bombs in this place, just because they're not a precise munition and they're designed to fight a big infantry. If we were offensively engaged somewhere as the United States, as NATO, and we needed to really push someone out in our interest, yes, you can use them. But I think right here, just because of where it is, they said it's not a place where civilians are now, which is true, but that's not the case. Will they be there later? And I just don't like the idea of someone stepping on one, someone picking one up and have, you know, they will clear it eventually. I just don't, I don't, I don't like the idea of cluster bombs. For those who don't know what they are, what is the issue about cluster bombs? Well, it's, it's a bomb that's dropped in an air burst out uh, about 70 other little bomblets, which are smaller bombs with parachutes, and then they explode in the air and air burst, and they're designed to take out personnel. The problem is, a lot of them don't go off, and then you've got a, a, mine, a shiny little toy sitting there on the ground. That uh, even if you know you only need to be unluck, uh, unlucky one time to step on one, or if a kid sees one in 10 years and 20 years, which could happen. Um, I just don't think it's the right place right now because it's not an offensive war. I don't think this is a defensive weapon at all. Louise, what's your view of this? Because I mean, a lot of people are saying you've got to stick it to the Russians with everything they're sticking it to the Ukrainians with. But is Absolutely. there not a moral compulsion to us to be above? and take the moral high ground here. I don't think there's any kind and gentle way to blow the enemy to bits. And the difference between Russia offensively using cluster bombs in Ukrainian cities where children can pick them up and Ukraine deploying them on its own territory. That is the key point here. I think the objectors would have a much better point if we said, go ahead, Ukraine, use them in Russian cities. Ukraine knows how to protect its own civilians and they're using them in fields where it's not very built up. And really, who are we to tell Ukraine how they can defend themselves? The biggest danger to Ukrainian civilians, including children, is the genocidal Russian army that is parked right there in front of them. And the best thing we can do for Ukrainian civilians is to get rid of the Russians as soon as possible. What about this whole issue, Rob, of Ukraine membership of NATO? Putin will be telling his people, as he always has done, this is exactly why I had to take action in Ukraine, because this was always part of the plan, that they would become part of NATO, and that would be an existential threat to our existence right on our border. Um, of course, you could argue that what Russia has done in Ukraine is precisely the reason why Ukraine should be a member of NATO, because if they had been, Russia probably wouldn't right. have gone in, because they'd know that then America and the rest of NATO would have to intervene. Right. Vladimir Putin knows he can say this is exactly what I was trying to avoid, because it makes him look like he still has something to stand on. But President uh, Biden said it the right ways. We can't do it now, because then that's potentially World War III, and NATO was formed to prevent World War III, not to start it. And if you can't... I mean, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky is going to, the, the, to Vilnius for the convention. And, I mean, everyone knows NATO's involved with this now. And my thing is either get in or get out. You don't need cluster bombs. B-52 them if you want to get them out of there. We know we're doing it. We're mission creeping it again. We're spending a lot of money and needlessly wasting lives, as far as I'm concerned. Where does this end, Louise, this, this war in Ukraine, do you think? No, I don't think you can believe a word that comes out of Vladimir Putin's mouth. If it was really about NATO, he would have done something. When we put 800 miles of NATO directly on his border when Finland joined NATO, what did he do? He didn't lob so much as a snowball over the fence. Mm. This only ends one way with Russia leaving Ukraine. It really is quite that simple, and that's the only way forward. Now, is Ukraine going to join NATO? Well, of course not, because there's a war going on in the middle of, of, of... We don't want to go directly to war with Russia, but we are going to help them. I think we need to help them quicker, faster. We're dragging this out. I agree with Rob that we should be giving them exactly what they need, including attackums, including aircraft, so that we can supply them with the weapons they need to defend their own country and just get the Russians out. There was a moment, Rob, was a bit disconcerting, as so many are with President Biden, where King Charles appeared to be 
scolding a guard and trying to direct the president. He seemed to be losing his way <laughs> as to exactly where he was or even what day it is. Um, I don't know if we've got any footage of that, but it was... I think we've got it, we've got it here, I think. But you, it was all a bit awkward, and the president does look like he doesn't really know where he is. This is the latest in a series of, well, just embarrassing moments, sort of senior moments. Yes. President Biden's fallen over, he's tripped mm -hmm. on planes, he's, you know, said some uh, daft things and so on. How concerning is this to you as an American citizen? We've seen President Biden have a lot of gaffes on stage, shaking hands with invisible people. In his defense on this part, I think when a lot of Americans go over there, they haven't been briefed up or studied enough on how to handle the royal family. We've, right. seen, it. We've seen it with President Trump. We saw President Obama give the queen uh, an eye pod that didn't work. I think we were talking about the green room. Mm. They, they, make a, they make a point of accidentally making themselves look like that. Uh, you know, don't walk in front of the king. Even I know that. But uh, I think the king did a good job kind of grabbing President Biden saying, hey, pal, let's do this. And well, actually, I was more concerned with the president kept grabbing the king because you just don't yeah, touch the monarch. I mean, <laughs> Louise, we know this. When the Australian Prime Minister Paul Keating once did this to the Queen Elizabeth, yeah. he was called the Lizard of Oz <laughs> by the British papers because you do not touch the monarch. And uh, Biden kept, kept, President Biden kept putting his arms grappling like an octopus around our monarch. Oh, Trying to get a better sniff of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was just being friendly. And afterwards, uh, the king spokesman said, look at the great warmth there is between these two leaders. It was a flying visit. He just wanted to give reassuring signals about the special relationship. And I think mission accomplished as far as that goes. As for his gaffes, my favourite living president, George W. Bush, you know, was famous for saying strategy and having a mouthful of marbles. Mm. So, again, I don't think this is... Anything new, quite I don't frankly. think he's having a mouthful of marbles. I think it's has he lost his marbles? <laughs> <laughs> Might be the bigger concern <laughs> for the world right now. Uh, Rob, great to see you as always. Anytime, Chris. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed.